Thank you. Okay, I have also one comment uh, from what Dr. Grabska uh, um, presented. Um, so it would seem um, that at least sort part of this elusive character of water uh, that is extremely exciting, but uh, also troublesome and was giving us uh, research community troubles for a long time. At least part of this uh, elusive character of vibrational spectrum of water results from what you have shown that the species, each, each species of the water, however we divide them, we could divide them into two groups, the weakly hydrogen bond water and strongly hydrogen bond water. This is the, the most uh, fundamental division. But nevertheless, the, no matter how we divide this, the components that are visible in the, uh, in the spectra underneath uh, the bands that we can measure are more complex on themselves. So this is maybe something uh, very uh, um, important to consider in, in future um, studies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much then. If there are no other questions, uh, I of course invite everyone to continue the discussion in, uh, in the chat. And now um, I will introduce to you Dr. Offerhaus, who received his master's degree in 1993 from Delft University of Technology in Netherlands and subsequently obtained his PhD in 1997 in laser physics from the University of Twente, also in Netherlands. Since then, he has worked on fiber lasers, nonlinear conversion, vibrational imaging, medical pharmaceutical analysis, plasmonics, Fourier optics, molecular spectroscopy, holography, gyroscopes, dielectric, dielectric sensing, optical sensors, and microfluidics. A truly, truly wide uh, scope of uh, scientific interests. In uh, 2020, uh, 2002, he joined the Optical Techniques Group in Twente and in uh, 2016 became the chair of the Optical Sciences Group. For the last 10 years, uh, a substantial effort has been devoted to the use of integrated photonic circuits for sensing, specifically the use of the uh, SEN platform. In Twente, he teaches courses on electromagnetism, optics and general physics. He has published more than 125 papers in refereed journals, holds four patents, and chairs the Atomic, Molecular, and Optical Physics Division of the Dutch National Physics Organization. And today, uh, Dr. Offerhaus will be presenting his talk on uh, detection of dissolved salts using the water spectrum. Please, Dr. Offerhaus, uh, the floor is yours. Now, hopefully, you can hear me. Um, so thank you very much for that nice introduction. And thank you for the invitation to speak at this conference. Uh, this is my first aquaphotonics conference. Uh, and the work, indeed, I am uh, about to present is not really um, a, uh, a standard aquaphotonics uh, subject, if you like. It's um, the reason that we did this work was very much because we felt that we were going to look at salts and we ended up looking at water. And I think that this is a familiar pattern maybe in for more of this, uh, this conference. But what I hope to talk about is something about uh, NIR um, absorption of water, although a lot of that has been covered already. Then I'll talk briefly about temperature, single salts, mixtures of salts, uh, the chips that we intended to make, and then some take home messages. And I'll try to keep this short as I can see that time has already progressed quite far. Let me first say though that the, um, the, the story that I'm about to present to you, uh, the work was done by Gerwin Steen, who is shown here in the middle at his graduation. Um, he turned out to be the 100th graduation at the Wetzes Institute. Wetzes is the Institute for Water Research in the north of the Netherlands. Uh, and this is where this, this work was done. Um, so let's start on the NIR absorption in water. 
Um, there are many models for the for the water, uh, some of which has just been been dealt with by the previous speakers. Um, the region that we were looking at, and this is because we were aiming for for applications on chip, was the sort of 900 to 1200 nanometer region. This is clearly not the strongest region because you're looking at, at high overtones, but it is a region where the water uh, absorption is still visible and it's a region that's very amenable to uh, chip applications. So we thought we would try there uh, to try our luck. The region there is, is dominated by uh, uh, stretch vibrations, symmetric and asymmetric, but there's also a clear influence of the, uh, of the bending modes. And so if you look carefully at the absorbance and you do this trick called differential absorption, um, then on the top, you can see the, uh, the absorption uh, of demineralized water. And then if you start adding salts, small changes appear. And these small changes, if you show those particularly, you can see that uh, you get dips in absorption and enhancement of absorption. And these, of course, have to do with the way in which the ions perturb the local water structure, change the uh, vibrations. And this you can then use to identify the salts. That was at least our intent. And so uh, what we do is, uh, and what I'll show uh, in the next slides, is how additions of salts change the absorption. Uh, if you do it just in the normal way, you get something like, like panel C, where for ever higher absorptions, you get uh, bigger and bigger differences in the, in the absorption. But what you would want to know really is the way in which the salts influence the water. And so you can renormalize these spectra by dividing out the uh, density of the ions and then look really only at the result. And then you get something closer to panel D. And if you do that carefully per wavelength, you in fact get a, can make a map like this where you see these differential absorptions for all different types of salts. And um, what you can see is that there are some salts that can be grouped together because they either increase first or decrease the, uh, the absorption later, but also the other way around. There's not a very clear distinction in the way in which this happens. It's not as easy to say there are uh, hydrogen breaking and hydrogen forming salts, but there are groups that can be made. What you can also see is that the influence of the uh, salts on the water is quite nicely linear in the sense that these bands do not change very much uh, over the different concentrations. Um, and so for the single salts, we thought, okay, we have a reasonable way in which we can identify different salts by their effect on the, uh, on the water spectrum. And then we thought one more thing we have to look at because it was a very clear and strong influencer is the role of temperature. So if you just look at pure water, uh, both in the sample and in the uh, reference arm, and you change the temperature uh, of the sample arm, you can see the temperature itself also has an effect on the hydrogen bonds, of course, which is also what you expect. It both lowers the peak and shifts the peak uh, to the shorter wavelength. It blue shifts the, uh, the absorption. So the important observations for temperature in most cases is that it causes the hydrogen bonds to weaken, resulting in a strengthening of the covalent o, uh, hydrogen bonds or, or OH bonds and a higher vibrational frequency. Um, alternatively, uh, you could also say that the reduced intensity of the stretching bands causes the spectra to appear blue shifted. So we're not totally sure what this is. We did not do the molecular uh, dynamic simulations to, uh, to further work on this. So then we thought, okay, now we're gonna add um, a single salt and look at the effect of temperature on the absorptions. So here's a, a number of um, examples on the upper left, calcium chlorate. Um, on the, the right, uh, we have some sodium nitrates. Uh, we also have sodium uh, hydroxide uh, on the lower left. And what you can see for all of them is that despite the fact that the overall way in which the ion uh, changes the, the absorption is different, the effect of temperature is relatively the same in the sense that 
the uh, the high temperature line tends to be the lowest on the left and then creep up higher on the right, whereas the blue line, the lowest temperatures uh, are higher on the left and uh, then dip under on the right. In other words, the effect of temperature on the absorption is relatively the same, despite the fact that the profiles themselves can be different. In other words, temperature has a general effect on all of the uh, salts, which kind of indicates that there is a more general process at play here. Um, of course, we did this with all the, the checks and balances. So we also measured offsets. We measured uh, uh, the residuals and so on. That's a single salt. So the, the general conclusions on the single salt absorption is that the temperature response, the slope and the temperature coefficients are quite the same despite different profiles. And in the 900 to 980 region, you get negative values and then at higher temperature on the longer wavelengths show smaller positive values. The dissolved salts shift the spectrum to the reds. The presence of the ions in the water therefore reduces the effect of increasing the temperature. In other words, the things that the salts do is somewhat in opposition of what the temperature does. So if you think of the temperature as mostly decreasing the order of the water, of breaking the network and making it more um, random, then in fact the salts coordinate the water and bring it more structure, which is also more or less what you expect and some of I think what we've seen at the conference already. Now another way of thinking about this also is to say that the acceleration of the rotation could be due to the coupling um, and especially the coupling of the slow collective components uh, with the motion of large hydrated clusters. This is a theory that has been proposed by Wei Zhang at all, uh, but that was done mostly for very high concentration ionic solutions. So uh, it has to be transferred to this regime with a little bit of, of uh, carefulness. Uh, another observation was that the temperature coefficients for uh, sodium nitrate uh, and sodium hydroxide uh, and calcium chloride are half as big as those for uh, potassium carbonate. And this might be explained by the charge of the anion. So of course, if you think about hydrogen shell or, or solvation shells, then the charge of the ion is very important. And you would expect that if the charge of the ion is twice as big, the influence it has on the surrounding solvation shells must be bigger. And um, so you see some of that in, uh, in the response of the different salts. Um, the different nitrates uh, combinations with sodium have similar coefficients, um, but not completely similar. So part of it, the 900 to 950 looks very similar, but then it diverges. So it's not purely uh, uh, anion based. Another thing that we found that we didn't quite expect is that um, there is nonlinearity in, uh, in the signal response to the ionic concentration. Um, so whereas first, when we were doing single salts at a single temperature, we could see fairly high linearity. When we combine it with temperature, you see that nonlinearity starts to, to play a role in the sense that there's not just the effect of the temperature separated from the effect of the uh, ions, but they in fact combine. And uh, we thought, okay, this is important because then the question becomes, do different salts also interact with each other when these ions are all in solution? And so then we started looking at mixtures um, and the effect of mixtures with respect to temperature. And here are, uh, is an example. So it's a, a sodium sulfate, uh, sodium nitrate concentration uh, or, or mixture. And on the left lower panel, you see uh, just the absorption for uh, sodium sulfate, as you would expect it. Uh, and on the right-hand side, the B0 indicates the normal absorption spectrum for that salt. But then there's also, if you try and uh, look at the complete absorption spectrum, you see that the two, in fact, influence each other and that there's another um, feature that must be seen as the nonlinear combination of both ions. In other words, the ions see each other and the fact that they see each other 
causes a combined effect. And this combined effect can be uh, modeled as a, a nonlinear component, a, co a combined component um, that is shown there. And what you see also is that the lower the temperature, the bigger this nonlinearity. In other words, it seems that if the temperature is lower and the water is to some extent more coordinated, the effect of the ions is on each other is also stronger. Uh, and when we increase the temperature, in this case up to uh, 45 degrees centigrade, um, this nonlinearity disappears. So the way in which we interpret this is that at higher temperatures, the solvation shells decrease. The influence, the range of influence that the ions have um, decreases. Uh, of course, here also we measured all the offsets and the, the, uh, the uh, residuals in the, in the modeling. Um, we did, of course, a whole range of combinations. If you do a lot of salts, there's even more combinations to be done. We did not do all of them, but here's another example to show you that um, also for carbonates and chlorates uh, of sodium, if you look at the combination spectrum, then they have a nonlinear component in them, a strong nonlinear component in them. Um, and here again, for low temperatures, so the blue line, you see that there is a strong nonlinear component between the two uh, salts. But if you increase the temperature, the uh, nonlinearity de decreases. In other words, the effect that the salts have on each other becomes less at higher temperatures. Um, and that means, again, that we interpret this in, in a way in that we're saying the solvation shells decrease, the effect of the ions becomes more local, and hence they interact less with each other. Um, so, as I said, we, we originally intended for this, this whole story to be um, uh, a detector with which we could see which salts were, were in water. And so we did realize, uh, together with a company called Lyonix International, we realized optofluidic chips with a, a structure where here in blue you can see there's water channels for a reference channel and a, a sample channel. Under it are long spirals uh, shown, for example, here, in which we can absorb uh, light through the evanescent field of the uh, of the light traveling through the channels. Um, it's not easy to generate these, um, these chips. So what you see here also is that there are scattering centers inside the chips. And we had a, uh, an interesting fight trying to get rid of those. Um, but by now we do have chips and we will be using them. We probably will not be using them for identifying salts in water though, because to a large extent, these absorptions are so small that any organic or other interference makes it very hard to uh, distinguish different salts. And with the interaction of the salts with each other and with other components, demixing these kind of mixtures becomes very, very hard. Um, nevertheless, it was a very interesting project and we learned a lot about water. Um, so the take home messages, uh, the things that I would say we really learned from this particular bit of research is first of all, that the NIR spectra so the, the 900 to 1200 region uh, in which we measure these spectra. Uh, if you look at the absorption carefully, the overtones show identifiable effects of ions. If you have single ions in solutions, the characteristic changes to the absorption of the water are enough to identify the ions. Uh, temperature actually has a sort of, uh, uh, you can see temperature as an ion itself. It has a, a typical effect uh, that you can distinguish if you just look at pure temperature. Combinations of ions show nonlinear dependence on the, uh, on the concentration. And the ionic effect uh, means that the, the water structure feels the other ions. Uh, temperature reduces this interaction of the ions and therefore reduces the sphere of influence, if you like, of the individual ions. So that was the compact version. I hope that was uh, not too fast, but I, I think we saved us a little bit of time. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And um, if there are any questions, um, of course, I'm open to them. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Overhaus. Uh, this was extremely, extremely interesting. I have one uh, comment and one uh, question. Um, 
the same uh, sensitivity towards ions uh, is present in ATR far ultraviolet spectroscopy. Yesterday, yeah. also Yukihiro Ozaki was uh, speaking about this. So I just wanted to mm -hmm, mention this. Uh, maybe this would be somehow interesting. And um, my question is- I certainly um, think so. Thank you. Um, Octofluidic chip. Um, so what could be, you said that this is, let's say, um, not very um, interesting or, or problematic to use this for uh, sensing salt seed water, but what would be the most, um, let's say, interesting and, and far-reaching um, application of this chip? So a, a more direct application where the absorptions are higher and clearer is, for example, if you look at uh, uh, monitoring um, pollutants in, in water, and you're not so, so the our original idea was to look at salt concentration because if you are in areas of heavy agricultural use you can for example see uh, too many phosphates in water um, that's hard because there are other things also in there but if you look at things that have a more clear absorption like for example contamination with um, heavy metals as you would have near mining sites or um, possibilities like that then you could still see those absorptions quite well uh, and you could make a chip-based device doing that kind of thing. Um, okay, this, this, yeah, this sounds very interesting. So basically this could be used for um, monitoring both organic and inorganic uh, contents. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I think in, in many cases then it's important that you have already some idea of what the possible pollutants are. So if you have no idea what the possible pollutants are, then it's then it's going to be too difficult to find out what exactly it is. You could still use it as a as a monitoring device and say, okay, if I see changes compared to the normal situation, I will bring it to a mass spectrometer and find out what it is later. Um, but if you already have an idea of what might be the possible contaminants, like in the case of, of nearby mines or something, then it can also be used to identify those. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I believe uh, Professor Tsenkova uh, uh, has a question. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for this presentation. I, I've been once to Wetsis, um, ah. and I've been always uh, wondering, um, this is exactly the place to, to use aquaphotomics, I think. Um, and I, I wonder, uh, is this device based on spectroscopy or, or not? I couldn't understand very well. So the, the, the work that I've shown is mostly, uh, was mostly done on uh, spectroscopy in, in bulk, so in transmission cells. Um, some of the measurements were also done on chip. Uh, so yes, th this is a spectroscopy uh, thing. But the, the whole institute, the whole Wetzel's Institute does very many different things. So it's not just spectroscopy on water. Uh, yeah, there's yes. also really, yeah. Yeah, I know, I know that Wetzel does lots of things. Mm. Um, but I think uh, if um, because you have, uh, uh, therefore, you have lots of opportunities to make a big database of spectra of water yes. with different pollutants and, and just make a modeling uh, on the first orbiton or second or whichever, but with, with, of course, uh, appropriate path length. And then I think um, everything that we, we speak at this conference um, might be very, very useful. Absolutely. Uh, because it's, um, you were absolutely right that we need this fast, and Zoltan uh, Kovac, he was talking, we've done this years ago, to monitor the uh, water and see the abnormality of the water. And then by the spectral pattern and aquagrams, they, they can lead you to the, the possible reason. If um, there are um, um, also database of models. Uh, for this, I think this is doable, and um, and I think this is the future. So uh, I'm very happy that you you um, gave us this talk, and we could establish a collaboration or connection with you. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for questions and presentation uh, from Dr. Overhouse. Uh, I invite you to continue the discussion uh, using the chat. And now uh, let me introduce uh, our last, but certainly not least uh, speaker in this session, uh, Dr. Nesta uh, Baisha, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the Research Center for Biomedical 
Engineering at uh, City University of London. She received PhD in Biomedical Engineering and prior to that, uh, she obtained Master's in 